Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank for the kind invitation, which is a real privilege to speak to your distinguished society. The title of the talk is The Impact of the Revolution in Hepatitis C Treatment on Hepatocellular Carcinoma, and I understand that not everybody is so deeply involved with the treatment of hepatitis C that I would like to explain to you where we are now with the treatment of hepatitis C. I want to give acknowledgments, colleagues within and outside of our department that helped me and provided also data and slides. And uh, these days, those working in viral hepatitis have a number of conflicts of interest to declare. Hepatitis C is a worldwide disease. Around 185 million people are chronic carriers and suffer from chronic hepatitis C. Hepatitis C associated end stage liver disease is number one indication for liver transplantation in Europe and the United States. The death rate due to hepatitis C is now greater than death rate to HIV and AIDS. There is no vaccine available to protect against hepatitis C virus, and there will be no vaccine in the years to come. However, the good news are Hepatitis C is the first curable chronic viral infection in man, and virus elimination prolongs survival. This is a big debate nowadays once registration of new hepatitis C drugs are being discussed in the light of their costs. This is one study, long-term follow-up of the previous standard of care, packet interferon with ribavirin, and long-term follow-up studies have shown that if the virus is undetectable, 12 weeks after the end of treatment, that this means cure in 97.5%. So SVR, sustained biological response, means no virus 12 weeks after the end of treatment, and this is equivalent to cure. This is uh, maybe one of the most cited studies in the field of hepatitis C these days, led by the group in Rotterdam uh, and various centers around the world, including ours, contributed their cases and comparing patients who cleared hepatitis C virus with interferon-based therapies with those who did not. So SVR versus non-SVR patient. And the surprising result was not, not that mortality due to liver disease was decreased. The surprise was that mortality, also all-cause mortality, was decreased and that patients also showed decreased mortality from cardiovascular events and non liver tumors. Now to the subject of liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC. Hepatitis C is a major cause of liver cancer. This here is a rather recent publication from 2015 showing that the prevalence of hepatitis C infection among patients with uh, liver cancer varies. There are high rates like in Japan where still 64% of patients with liver cancer uh, suffer from chronic hepatitis C while in other regions of the world, like in China, hepatitis B is the dominating cause of liver cancer. Usually, acute hepatitis C infection only rarely manifests as an overt acute disease. However, 50 to 80 percent of those being infected with hepatitis C virus become chronic carriers. Of those, after 10 to 20 years, around 15 to 20 percent develop cirrhosis, and complications are well known, like varices, like ascites, like encephalopathy, but also liver cancer. And liver cancer, in particular in hepatitis C, is the most prevalent and the most important complication of liver cirrhosis. In hepatitis C, almost exclusively, liver cancer occurs once cirrhosis has developed. Liver cancer is among the top 10 cancers in the world. But if we look at mortality, I think, if I'm correct, it's number three causing death in men. When we look at the prevalence of liver cancer mortality, we see high mortality rates in China and in Africa. This is still much due to hepatitis B virus infection. And the prevalence of liver cancer also varies in different parts of the world. When you look at the right side of this slide, you see that in some areas of the world, liver cancer is decreasing. This is where vaccination protocols, global vaccination protocols for hepatitis B are in place for the last 30 years. However, in the Western world in particular, 
the hepatitis C associated liver cancer is increasing. And this is due to the fact that despite transmission of hepatitis C virus by blood and blood products has been almost eliminated due to the introduction of hepatitis C antibody testing and RNA testing in blood units in 2090, we still have the peak of hepatitis C associated liver cancer ahead of us. And this is modeling by Dr. Razavi for Germany, England, France, and Spain. And you still see that hepatitis C associated cancer is increasing. So what is the revolution of hepatitis C treatment? I think hepatitis C therapy is a masterpiece of translational research. The virus was discovered by Dr. Michael Houghton and his group at Chiron in 1989. Three years before Dr. Hufnagel first introduced conventional interferon to treat that time called non-A, non-B hepatitis. And in the years to come, the discovery of the virus was followed by diagnostic tests for antibody, RNA. Dr. Bartenschlager developed the Replicon system, which was a prerequisite to develop direct acting antiviral agents. And also the possibility to have the virus grown in culture was a significant step forward. At the same time, therapy developed with conventional interferon, pecular interferon, combination with ribavirin, until in May, 2011, the first direct acting antiviral agents were approved, two different protease inhibitors, and this started a new age. Before that, 10 years, the standard of care between 2001 and 2011 was the combination of either one of the two peculated interferons in combination with ribavirin. This has been a torture for the patients being treated up to 72 weeks, suffering from interferon side effects like flu-like symptoms, atralgias, anemia, bone marrow depression, and only 50% of genotype 1 patients were cured, which means the most prevalent and most, most severe form of chronic hepatitis C. However, times have changed. After the approval of the first direct-acting antiviral agents, telaprevir and bocepravir, we have seen a number of, tar of drugs being approved in recent years. In 2014, seven different direct-acting antivirals were approved. They all are targeting three different key steps in the replication cycle of the hepatitis C virus. In blue, the protease. In red, it's the polymerase and the green are NS5A inhibitors. The NS5A is a unique non-structural -stru protein encoded by the hepatitis C virus involved in replication, but mainly maturation of the virus. So this is unique to hepatitis C virus. And this all led to therapies combining direct acting antivirals being free of interferon and leading to cure rates up to a hundred percent. And this is a development we have seen since the discovery of the virus. I also, it's a pleasure to tell you that hepatitis C is the hottest topic in gastroenterology. And as published in 2013, even before the last wave of direct acting antiviral agents, nine out of the 20 top cited papers in clinical gastroenterology are dealing with hepatitis C. We also see a development from many drugs for a long time to one single drop once a day. On the left side, you see therapy until January 2014. You had to take drugs like telapria, bocepria every eight hours together with fatty meals. You had to take ribavirin causing anemia. And on top of that, you had to inject interferon once a week. On the right side, you see the first fixed dose combination approved in November 14, 2014, which is sofosbuvir together with ledipasvir. Sofosbuvir also made history because in November, a small phase two study done in New Zealand was reported at the American liver meeting. One month later, Gilead paid $11 billion for this phase two drug it was approved in January 2014, and the return of investment was completed December last year. 
We have several treatment options available now in 2015 and the guidelines of the European Association for the Study of the Liver published in April this year summarize this nicely and who's interested, I refer to the homepage. You have either sophosphovir-based therapies or a so-called 3-DAA combination or you still have interferon ribavirin together with direct acting antiviral agents as the approved drugs. There is not yet one pill fits all. We have different regimens for different genotypes. The most widely used combination is on the left side, Harvoni, it's fixed dose combination of uh, sofosbuvir, ledepasvir, a uh, polymerase inhibitor and an NS5A inhibitor. On the other side, you have the 3D regimen combining a protease in NS5A and a non-nucleoside polymerase inhibitor. In genotype 1 patients, the most prevalent genotype, they lead to a cure rates more than 95% and applying therapies not for 48 to 72, but between 8 and 24 weeks. However, the costs are high. They vary between different countries. In Germany, the fixed dose combination started for 12 week course with 66,000 euros. In France, I think the 36 increase, it's uh, 46 increases 36, and already the first generic appeared in India for $250. So, in the years to come, due to the high costs, we need to prioritize treatment, and here the guidelines differ around the world. I now switch to hepatitis C associated liver cancer. You are well aware with the treatment algorithm of hepatocellular carcinoma therapies. These algorithms are regularly updated and published, and the first and last author usually comes from Barcelona, Dr. Love or Dr. Bru. They are in lead of these guidelines development of treatment algorithms. We either have curative therapies with an early stage where we do radiofrequency ablation, resection, or liver transplantation, or in advanced stages, we apply palliative therapies like ablation therapies, transarterial chemoembolization, sorafenib, or best supportive care. However, unfortunately, the majority of patients are diagnosed in a stage where only palliative therapies can be applied. Where could we use hepatitis C therapies? And where could hepatitis C therapies be part of the treatment algorithm to manage patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. First of all, to treat hepatitis C at various stages in order to prevent liver cancer. Once it's developed, the question is whether we can support ablative therapies in order to prevent recurrence of liver cancer. And then certainly a special issue is liver transplantation. Only a minority of patients are eligible for liver transplantation. But overall, 25% of liver transplantations are due to hepatitis C, and an increasing proportion of patients suffer from both cirrhosis and liver cancer. And the big question we have to answer is whether hepatitis C therapies can contribute in a cost-effective way to the non-curative therapies on the right side. First, I would like to discuss prevention of liver cancer development in hepatitis C patients, and then in the time remaining, I would like to discuss whether we can lower the risk of HCC recurrence after curative local regional therapies or surgery, whether we can uh, improve palliative approaches, and finally discuss liver transplantation. You should never forget that patients with liver cancer almost exclusively suffer in addition from liver cirrhosis, so they have two diseases that threaten their lives, liver cancer plus liver cirrhosis. So when we try to prevent liver cancer, we have to discuss the therapy of early chronic hepatitis C, whether we can prevent progression of fibrosis, then whether we can reverse cirrhosis. Years ago, it has been a dogma, even for pathologists, that cirrhosis can never be reverted. And then whether once cirrhosis has developed, whether therapy of hepatitis C can prevent further development of liver cancer. This is a study, it's an overloaded slide. You never should show such an overloaded slide. But I show it because it's historically very important and will stay important. 
Dr. Paina and I had been a privileged co-author, he investigated and analyzed all the registration trials of sharing plow, leading to approval of conventional pegulant interferon and in combination with Ira Viren. Here, more than 3,000 patients had paired biopsies before and after therapy. This will not happen again because less and less liver biopsies are being done because we have non-invasive measures like FibroScan in place. But this study clearly has shown that successful treatment, achieving SVR, achieving cure, is associated with improvement in liver histology, including reversal of cirrhosis. Ten years later, Dr. Ambrosio clearly has shown that if we treat patients with liver cirrhosis for hepatitis C, that in those where we clear the virus, that more than 60% show cirrhosis regression. However, we still have to prove that this always means reduced risk to develop liver cancer. So the question is, does cure of hepatitis C infection prevent carcinoma development? And I just want to discuss very briefly what we have already learned from hepatitis B. In hepatitis B, in contrast to C, we cannot cure. We only can suppress viral replication. And the group from Taiwan very clearly has shown that the risk to develop liver cancer clearly is associated with the level of viral replication. And again, a study led by authors from Taiwan, but being multicentric, multinational in Asia, and these data have been confirmed in Europe, shows that if you suppress replication here in the case with lamivudine, you can reduce the risk of cancer development in liver cirrhosis, although not exclusively. So what do we know in hepatitis C? Again, this consortium led by Rotterdam looked at persons with advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, how cir cancer development is in those patients that cleared the virus compared to those who did not. And clearly, if you clear hepatitis C, you significantly reduce the risk to develop liver cancer. And there were more studies reported in the literature. This is a meta-analysis by Dr. Morgan, and all studies show that clearing hepatitis C is reducing the risk of cancer development in patients with advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. Another important question is, how is the risk of patients with cirrhosis where hepatitis C was cured? Is the risk eliminated? Is it decreased? And how should we do surveillance in those patients? And the clear message is that the older the patient, the more advanced the fibrosis level is, the higher is the risk to develop recurrent cancer, and therefore early treatment is the way to go. And there are other authors also developing risk scores which may be helpful for surveillance of those patients. So in summary, if there is successful hepatitis C treatment in patients with chronic hepatitis C and or cirrhosis, we can prevent fibrosis progression, we can reverse cirrhosis and at the end prevent liver cancer. So now we are dealing with patients that have developed liver cancer. Can we lower the risk for hepatitis C-associated cancer development after curative therapies, meaning after radiofrequency ablation or surgery? So this is the left part of the treatment algorithm, and there are some data in the literature showing that all treatments, or in particular RFA-associated treatments, that those patients profit from previous clearance of hepatitis C patients, and the same is true for recurrence of cancer. So we really have to acknowledge that clearing hepatitis C virus either before or after local regional ablation therapies is beneficial for the patient and for cancer development. Now we switch to the most difficult part, can hepatitis C therapy also in a cost-effective way be beneficial in patients where treatment approach is palliative 
and not curative. However, this is the most difficult part and data are missing so far. The only what we can say is that hepatitis C therapies, the new therapies with direct acting antiviral agents, they are safe. Interferon-based therapies could not be used in those patients with advanced disease. The new direct acting antiviral agents are safe. However, we have to show that they have an impact on the natural cause of the disease. So it's a big unmet need in the field of hepatitis C-associated liver cancer, whether there is a role for HCV treatment in patients treating palliative liver cancer therapy. The last section I would like to discuss is the management of hepatitis C patients before and after liver transplantation. Do not forget that this is a small proportion of overall patients with liver cancer, and in many parts of the world, liver transplantation has not become reality yet. Nevertheless, this is by itself the largest group of patients undergoing liver transplantation. Around 25% of liver transplantations are due to end-stage liver disease caused by hepatitis C with or without liver cancer. There is a high restriction on patients undergoing liver transplantation. The so-called Milan criteria are applied for many years now because those patients with a single nodule less than five centimeter or not more than three and less than three centimeter without extrahepatic metastasis, without microvascular invasion, those patients have a less than 10% risk to experience recurrence of liver cancer after transplantation, while others recur, in particular supported by immunosuppressive therapy. A movement we also see in recent years is that the proportion of hepatitis C patients on the waiting list that have, in addition to cirrhosis liver cancer, is increasing. This also is reflecting the proportion of patients with hepatitis C, but also it is due to the fact that patients with the, in areas where the MELT system is applied, meaning that the sickest patients are transplanted first, MELT lab score based on, on bilirubin, renal function, and INR. However, there are standard exceptions for patients with liver cancer, so patients with liver cancer are treated at an earlier stage of their liver disease. However, we face in many parts of the world, in particular in Germany, the problem of a huge gap between the demand for liver transplantation and available donor organs. This means that waiting list, waiting time is increasing and the development of liver cancer in cirrhotic patients while being on the waiting list is a major problem, in particular for hepatitis C patients. You see 66% of de novo cancers on the waiting list are due to hepatitis C. There's another problem. While hepatitis B has been a contraindication in 1990, it is now among the best indications for liver transplantation we have been able for the last 10 years to prevent of recurrence of hepatitis B. If you look where the red arrow is, these are hepatitis C patients. So hepatitis C is the worst indication for liver transplantation because reinfection of the graft is universal. And therefore it's a waste of resources doing liver transplantation in hepatitis C. So here we have a big challenge. Can we prevent recurrence of hepatitis C after liver transplantation by treating before? And once recurrent hepatitis has occurred, like in many hepatitis C patients transplanted so far, can we cure those patients? The use of interferon ribavirin has seen very limited success, so it was not an option. The proof of concept came from a very specific group of patients. These are patients with liver cancer and hepatitis C. Being on the waiting list and having the standard exception, meaning an early liver cirrhosis child A and liver cancer. And this study just used the phosphovir and ribavirin in a phase two trial, and once patients were negative, they underwent liver transplantation. However, we should not forget they were early, they had child A cirrhosis. Rapid decline in viral load, 
The majority of patients were soon HCV RNA negative, and the results of shown here a publication from January of this year in gastroenterology that 70% of those patients being negative at time of transplantation stayed negative after transplantation. And this is at a time when the phosphorus and ribavirin were used, which is not the standard of care today. The more important message of this paper is that all patients apart from one that were negative for the virus after 30 days of treatment stayed negative after transplantation. So the message is if we can keep patients before transplantation 30 days negative for HCV RNA, we should be able to prevent reinfection, which is a major step forward. Now we have more regimen for treatment in place. We have more chases, choices, and response rates are going up. Another important question is, how should we deal with patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis, like ascites, like renal insufficiency? And here we have limited possibilities available because only two regimen are approved for the use in decompensated cirrhosis. Very recently, it was shown that patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis before and after liver transplantation show very surprisingly good response rates, close to 90% SVR. And when we look at liver function, liver function also improved in the vast majority of patients. However, there is a group of patients where obviously cure of hepatitis C does not prevent decompensation and progression of liver disease. In addition, the approved regimen with sofosbuvir cannot be used in patients with renal insufficiency, which also is prevalent in this severely sick patient population. So a major unmet need and a challenge in decompensated liver disease due to hepatitis C is to define the point of no return when it doesn't make sense anymore to treat before under transplantation. However, for them, it's an option to treat after transplantation. The therapy after transplantation again started with sofosbuvir and ribavirin. The treatment was highly efficacious with 70% with this regimen, which is no longer standard of care. The treatment is well tolerated. Almost all patients completed the treatment. And then the big question is, how should we deal with decompensated cirrhosis after transplantation? And this is more or less a figure you have seen before from patients before transplantation. The majority of patients improves liver function. However, we still need to define those shown with red bars that still progress despite clearance of the virus. Again, new drugs are available. There are even new regimen that can be used in renal insufficiency. So the facts on hepatitis C and liver transplantation is that we are able to prevent recurrence, and this is relevant for all patients with liver cancer undergoing liver transplantation. And the treatment of post-liver transplant HCV is now possible, highly efficacious, and safe. The final question is, is it possible to prevent liver transplantation in the future? Can we successfully treat decompensated cirrhosis? This is a prerequisite in order to achieve this goal. The outlook for hepatitis C and liver cancer is certainly that we should, first of all, make all transplanted patients free of hepatitis C. We have to go out to the population of patients that already underwent liver transplantation because of the rapid progression of fibrosis to clear virus. And certainly we should aim that in the future, at least in 10 to 20 years from now, no patient should undergo liver transplantation anymore, suffering from liver cancer caused by hepatitis C. So the vision for the future clearly is no more hepatitis C associated liver cancer. And this goal certainly can only be achieved if there's access to therapies. Here is the major problem. The costs are high. Interferon-based therapies are still highly prevalent in many parts of the world. And in particular, decompensated cirrhosis cannot be treated with these regimens. So these patients need the revolution of hepatitis C therapy, the new DAAs. So global access is the major goal in order to prevent liver cancer due to hepatitis C. 
Thank you very much for your attention.